afternoon and evening to you all and welcome to the second and last Together for Safety talk in 2022. My name is Jeppe Albers and I'm the Executive Director of the Nordic Safe Cities Alliance and I'm joining you here from Copenhagen in Denmark. Nordic Safe Cities is a city network, a regional alliance of cities in Scandinavia and Northern Europe, founded in 2015 after terror attacks in Copenhagen. And uh, we spend our time uniting political leaders, city professionals, law enforcement, youth, civil society, and innovative thinkers in the region uh, to work together on safety and inclusion to prevent extremism and hate. This is the second year that we are co-hosting the Together for Safety Talks with the Strong Cities Network. Our two city networks have benefited uh, from a strong partnership for a long time now, and we have decided to reinforce our collaboration by again hosting this series of online talks with speakers from around the world to inspire and support you out there listening today, national local leaders, professionals, youth, working with different perspectives and new ideas on how we can push back polarization and hate and strengthen local democracies and social cohesion in the cities and communities where you live. Uh, at the previous Together for Safety talk three weeks ago, where some of you uh, might have attended, we focused on how we could safeguard local democracies by positively engaging citizens to take part in democratic conversations. And we also discussed how to safeguard elections and counter foreign uh, election interference and online misinformation. Today, we will focus on safe city governance, the role of networks and alliances. We will examine what cities and regions can do to inspire each other and ensure horizontal sharing of knowledge and approaches to extremism prevention. This will uh, uh, take its form over the three following sessions in today's webinar, where we will look at different levels, uh, national, regional, and local alliances, with a particular focus on building local resilience and social cohesion with civil society. Here from uh, Copenhagen and Nordic cities, we're especially proud to welcome our Nordic partners into the conversation today, including our core partner in Norway, the Gensidi Foundation, and their director, Ingrid Luang, who will later today share some of the models and some of the work we're doing together on alliance building uh, against extremism uh, in Norway. For you uh, listening today and taking part in the conversation, it's possible to ask questions by using the Q&A function throughout the chat, and please do write your thoughts, contributions, comments, ideas into the chat throughout the sessions. They're very much welcome, and we will pick up on them afterwards if we don't have the time to reply today. I would also like to draw your attention to the fact that this event is being recorded and Chatham House rules do not apply. And now, uh, without further, with further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our first moderator, uh, who many of you know, it is Daniel Houghton, who is a head of international programs at the Strong Cities Network, uh, Dan is responsible for a lot of uh, events and activities as has been for a while and responsible for strategy and delivery of uh, international programs uh, at ISD and, and Strong Cities Network. This includes at the moment uh, projects to develop institutional approaches to long-term governance, human security, social policy, challenges in cities across Africa, uh, Asia, the Balkans and the Middle East. Uh, Dan, I uh, pass over the platoon to you uh, for the first session. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be with everybody today. And thank you for joining this, as, as Yeppe said, um, the second in this year's series of collaborative webinars between the Strong Cities Network and the Nordic Safe Cities. It's been um, a real opportunity over the past two years having these webinars to look at perspectives that, that uh, obviously focus on, on the Nordic region, but look then also at comparing that experience around the world. Uh, with, the, with the global membership and, and partners of the Strong Cities Network. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, it was fantastic to have the most recent uh, webinar focusing on safeguarding local democracy and, and the sort of threats to democratic institutions and principles uh, from what we are now seeing is, is, is really a hybrid set of threats at the local level. Uh, so um, today's webinar takes that a, a step further and we look really at the role of, of networks. <clears throat> we will throughout today's webinar hear from those involved in, in networks of cities and towns and, and regions. We'll also look at nationwide networks, at practitioner networks, a number of different uh, collaborative bodies that are working on pooling experience and lessons and learning uh, on preventing violent extremism in different contexts. <clears throat> I'm pleased that we will look at a number of different global uh, contexts and our, our first session um, will look in particular at uh, an example from uh, the Global North in, in Germany and an example from the Global South in, in Kenya. 
I'm very pleased that we have uh, two distinguished speakers joining us for this panel. Uh, we have Mikewa Agada and Mark Elksnat joining us. Um, and so I will ask each of them to speak and explain a little bit about the work uh, of their networks and, and, and some of the learnings that comes from the work that they've done in, in Kenya and Germany, respectively. Uh, we'll then have a little bit of a discussion around uh, some of the, the uh, really important takeaways from those networks uh, and, and what we can uh, really take forward for the rest of the discussion. There'll be an opportunity to uh, ask some questions, so please do use the chat and Q&A functions at the bottom of your screen to post questions. Uh, uh, panelists can respond there in text or we can put uh, questions to them at the end of their presentations. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome our first speaker uh, today on this session. Uh, Mikewa Ogada is an independent researcher and M&E consultant from Kenya. He's got 20 years or more of experience in the fields of violence prevention, including preventing and countering violent extremism, policing, and human rights and access to justice issues. Mikewa is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the uh, lessons from Kenya's Peace, Security and Development Network. And uh, it'd be fascinating to, to hear his perspective. So Mikewa, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you and greetings to you all. Um, uh, as you've heard, I'm Mikael Gada, a security and justice consultant based in uh, Nairobi. And I wanna talk about um, some of the lessons that we learned over time uh, about the work of uh, the PSD network. I believe that the lessons learned from the work of this now defunct network are relevant and are valuable to practitioners around the world seeking to understand more about the value of networks and the partnerships uh, that partnerships can have in addressing and preventing extremism. I was privileged to provide technical assistance in organizational development for an eight year period to this important network of five NGOs working on peace, security and justice issues in Kenya's coastal region. During this time, my colleagues and I became intimately familiar with the network's activities and dynamics. In terms of strengths and achievements of this network, Evidence we gathered during this period confirmed to us that the positive perceptions about the PSD network's effectiveness and impact in extremism prevention resulted from the willingness of its five partners to blend their diverse and sometimes conflicting mandates and approaches, which included human rights, peace building, interfaith dialogue, and youth economic empowerment activities. The PSD network partners were able to address the multidimensional issues of violent extremism, ethnic polarization and resource-based conflicts affecting this part of Kenya because they were able to jointly design and utilize multi-pronged approaches that no single actor had the capacity to deploy on their own. Also evidence we generated over time showed that networking helped broaden the geographic scope and sustainability of the network's interventions. In addition, the partnership between the PSD network members contributed to fostering the present day solidarity and cohesion that we see between human rights activists, development workers and religious actors who work on peace, security and justice issues in coastal Kenya. We also found that local communities were able to share critical intelligence and information with specific network partners that they felt most at ease with. In some cases, it was religious leaders, while in others, it might be human rights or peace workers. Whatever the case, the wonderful thing is that all this intelligence and information was shared within one network of actors and subsequent interventions were planned jointly. What we also thought was very smart from a security point of view was the inclusion of two highly respected and authoritative religious organizations amongst the five network partners. This, at least for some time, gave the PSD network considerable latitude to be publicly critical of the Kenya government's harsh counterterrorism measures without fear of significant reprisals. In terms of weaknesses and challenges associated with the network, a major weakness and challenge we found over time with the networking approach to extremism prevention was that the more the actors, the more time it took to make decisions and build consensus on the form interventions would take. In addition, the impact of what would have otherwise been straightforward interventions would sometimes be diluted when each partner's contribution and participation had to be taken into account. We repeatedly witnessed arguments amongst network leaders over how to plan, prioritize, and sequence the use of different interventions. For example, in some cases, religiously inclined network partners believed and argued that other partners' advocacy for human rights accountability complicated or impeded peace work and vice versa. This would happen despite the fact that we worked with them over several weeks to negotiate and establish a memorandum of understanding to guide their networking and partnership. 
Regrettably also the PSD network partners were almost entirely donor funded and therefore in large measure not self-driven. The sustainability of the network and its impacts have suffered as a result. Turning to potential benefits that horizontal knowledge sharing and prevention approaches may have for cities and actors, we do have some important examples of communities of practice effectively documenting and sharing evidence on extremism prevention and violence prevention generally in Kenya. However, the capacities of many actors still can still be shored up to enable them to better inform policy, law, and administrative practices related to extremism prevention, at both the national and subnational levels. Looking ahead, I believe that routinizing and adequately financing such horizontal information sharing processes in the Kenyan context, and I believe in other contexts, will continue to be challenging and is an area requiring significant planning and investment. I would therefore recommend that actors such as the Strong Cities Network continue to upscale support to these communities of practice so that they can shore up their capacities to generate, document, and share quality evidence on practices and interventions for extremism prevention. In closing, I feel strongly that there's an urgent need for our development partners to support researchers and practitioners in the global south to lead the way in documenting and telling the stories of networks like the PSD network. There's in fact many different kinds of local capacity around Kenya and in other developing contexts for this storytelling. This local capacity should be encouraged and facilitated. Thank you for listening to me. Okay, well, thank you so much for a really concise and, and to the point presentation. And I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. It's really interesting actually to start with, um, you know, a network that, as you say, is now defunct, but where there are a number of learnings that, that can be taken forward and, and used, not just in the Kenyan context, but actually have some lessons uh, related to, to how we make this cooperation most effective and, and sustainable. But you pointed to a number of issues. So thank you so much for that contribution. We're going to come up, come back to, to, to Mikewa's uh, presentation and some of the points he raised in the discussion afterwards. But for now, I'd like to, uh, to welcome our next speaker. And we're going to uh, turn our attention away from, from Kenya for a moment and over to Germany. Uh, Mark, fantastic to have you with us and thank you so much um, for joining us. Mark Elksnat is uh, head uh, of unit uh, at the German Association for Cities and Municipalities since 2016. He works for the cybersecurity unit uh, and he's currently responsible for the areas of uh, general constitutional questions, security, public health and migration and integration. Mark, I think there are a number of lessons that we can learn from what is I think a very active network um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. The floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you, Dan Thank you, Daniel. Um, yeah, we, we actually did in the last year um, a big project with our federal ministry of interior to to explore um, different kinds of um, de-radicalization projects in Germany. We have around uh, 11,000 municipalities, so it was, um, and we have a lot, we learned that there are a lot of uh, different projects that are, um, that are really good. So um, from this project and from this um, really, really good um, project, we have some takeaways I want to share to, to say how, how we want or, or what's, what's the take on building a network in, in general and what you have to do and what you should do um, from our perspective. So first of all, um, it seems easy, but analyze the situation on the ground. Consider your local problems and the needs with a regard um, to extremist phenomena and discuss them with people, offices, clubs, societies, civil, civil society, uh, and all the actors you have in your local municipality or in your region. Um, take into account that the different perspectives of participants and consider different dim dimensions that can play a role on the ground. Um, for example, are there specific possible frequent radicalization processes? Do they, these occur in, in a specific type of extremism, such as uh, Islamism or right-wing extremism, left-wing extremism? Uh, so you have to tackle a special issue or do we have to tackle a lot of, or many issues which is quite more complicated, uh, actually, like you may uh, imagine. Um, are there actually organized extremist groups or are there individuals uh, active on the ground? Um, there are uh, the key points in before you actually start building your network, analyze the situation. 
it's really important for the success of your network and of the de-radicalization process as we experienced. Um, second of all, um, after you analyze it, explore which competencies and expertise potential target groups need. So, for example, you have um, a youth group who radicalizes um, over the internet. They, they, need, uh, they have different needs than, for example, elderly people who are extremism, or um, you have um, migrants that are radicalized, uh, radicalized, that radicalized. So you, you just have to have the best approach for your local problem. That's a big takeaway. Um, so third, third point is uh, clarify your mandate and the interests of the stakeholders involved. Uh, I think that's what uh, Mikave um, already told. Uh, you, you, you need, you need to, 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 or he addressed it. You need to consider the involvement of various stakeholders in the field of excellence and their respective interests. They, this may result in a um, different specific orders to approach for you. For example, a security agency might have a different uh, approach than, for example, a civil organization whose, um, whose focus is on education. So you have different actors in your, in your stakeholder and pot or in your network. You have to bring them together and organize them and keep your goals in order. Uh, big, uh, it's a big problem, but you can actually, everybody can benefit from the exchange on, on the different goals. You have to clarify it in advance, your, your actually work and your groundwork. Um, you, you also need to clarify what offers and resources are available. Um, like, you, like many municipalities and cities say, uh, money is all, always tight. So clarify what resources you could use, what resources you could, can require from other organizations, like from the regional or the national level. Um, you, you need to, to, to be in a constant exchange with the different levels, um, also with private actors like um, ISD or, or for, ex for example, or some, some other um, actors that focus on, on extremism prevention um, to also acquire additional resources, even in building the network, first of all. Um, after you, you, you plan it and you are in your, in your network, uh, you need to, uh, to talk about implementation. Uh, so you, first of all, it's important to invest in confidence building methods. Like what, what does it mean? Uh, task descriptions and agreements contribute significantly to the security of action of the persons involved. Um, you, you need to um, build trust uh, within your network, but also with the people out of your network. What are you doing? Why are you doing? Be transparent, be, uh, be truthful, and also tell what is the problem, why you see the problem, and take advantage of the civil society in your local municipality. Um, I think my, my time runs up, but uh, I just will, uh, will share one more point, which I think it's it's really important. You need to stay flexible during your project program and during your network and de-radicalization process. Uh, you need to expect changes and deviations. Good planning is important, uh, but you can predict everything. Depending on current events on site, you may have to uh, <clears throat> you may have to discover a new target group after the start of matters, for example, or completely or partially adapt, further develop or realign the approach to your uh, target group. So communicate necessary changes transparently to the actors involved, bind if necessary, um, uh, bind in additional actors, um, and try to get additional funding actually, if, if it's necessary to adapt your network. Your network is a living project. It's not, it's not a static project, it's a living project um, with a goal to benefit for everybody. I think I will, I will close with that and uh, I hope for a good discussion. Mark, thank you so much for that. And it's um, a really, really important perspective from um, I think quite long, a long-standing network. And as you say, with some 11,000 municipalities in, engaged. So uh, I, I imagine that throws up an enormous set of challenges, some of which you've alluded to, 
Um, but it's it's actually been really interesting through both of your contributions. With Mikewa, I can see his uh, M&E specialism coming to the fore in, 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 in some of the summary that he's given us. And I think, Mark, also you've given us a really solid analysis there. I wonder if I can just take a step back as we look at this and, and just set the scene for those that are listening who are not necessarily familiar with either of these networks. Um, and, and Mikewa, perhaps first of all, you can just explain um, who some of the partners are that were involved in this network, what their different mandates were. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn to Mark to do the same. Uh, I think that poses some interesting questions. Um, yeah, very quickly, there were five uh, civil society partners in this network. So it was entirely exclusively civil society. We had uh, Muslims for Human Rights, that's Muhuris, quite a well known NGO in Kenya and the region. We had uh, Kenya Muslims Youth Alliance. Uh, I think it's quite self-explanatory from the name. Uh, we had uh, Council of Imams and Preachers of Kenya, that's an Islamic clerical organization. Then we also had uh, Coast Interfaith um, uh, Council of Clerics, which was an interfaith dialogue um, sort of uh, organization that brought Christian and Islamic and other types of uh, uh, religious organizations together into one body to foster interfaith dialogue and understanding. And finally, we had uh, Kekoske, that is Kenya um, uh, Education Support Community Support Group, um, which is an NGO that deals with uh, outreach issues um, and uh, outreach on violence prevention in particular. So, they I mean, obviously, by, and they were completely funded by the NIDA. Uh, so, uh, this project was completely funded by the NIDA for an eight year period. And when that ended, unfortunately, it fell apart, but the organizations are still active, but not as. The PSD network. I see. Mikewa, it's interesting because a number of them share similar mandates, but it but you alluded to um you know trying to understand exactly where some of the conflicting areas were. Uh, and as as um as Mark was just talking about, you know, really clarifying the mandates between these different partners uh, is, is, a, is a really important lesson. And I, I think um it poses the question of, of sort of leadership and coordination, which I, I want to explore with both of these networks. But Mark, before we do that, perhaps just explain something um, to, to those who are tuning into this around the kinds of stakeholders who are involved. And, and you talk about 11,000 municipalities. Um, do we assume, therefore, that that's municipalities and, and towns of, of, of all sizes across Germany? And, and who from those municipalities is really the, the, the person, the stakeholder, engaged with the network yeah well it's um it's a good question most of all or, or, or as as we ex, uh, there, there are different networks in in the municipalities so we don't have one big network uh, that's to to clarify but as we experienced it um it's important um, for local um, network that the mayor or uh, the the head of the local government is actually leading on leading by example in in the network if if it's um, if the municipality started or the city or region started and you have to involve um, like Mikeva said um, teachers or the education branch it's really important to to involve education branch. Um, it's really important, actually, to, uh, as we experienced it, um, to involve security branches and the civil actors, like the local clubs, um, the, and also churches and uh, religious communities. They're, they take uh, in some or in in uh, parts of religious fundamentalism and extremism. It's really important to have the churches and the religious communities on your side and be um, try to get them get them involved in prevention um, that's a really big part as we experienced it and you you have to coordinate continuously um, and get the right approach that's what what i can share in this this uh, point there, there are a lot of projects like um, for example, in, if, if you go to Wolfsburg, a city in, in northern Germany, um, they involved um, also the um, some sports clubs, etc. Just to to get the youth uh, more young people involved in um, 
in prevention and to foster this issue of uh, preventing radicalization. Mark, thank you. I think that's really helpful. And thanks for some of the clarifications there. And it's really good, I think, to, to understand a little bit more about specifically the different partners that, that you've involved. On the question then of, of, of leadership and coordination, because Mikewa, one quote from, from your presentation that, that stuck out, the more actors you have, the more time it took to make decisions. Uh, one added sort of complication to that, as you say, was that you were dependent upon, this network was dependent upon donor support from Danida for, for, for eight years. Um, how did these organizations that came together in this network make decisions effectively is my first question uh, and, and what kind of um, institutional framework was necessary in order to to make those decisions effective um, and the second part of the question is how did they make decisions that were genuinely driven by these organizations and by the situation they should they saw on the ground as, as mark said his, his first lesson was analyze the situation on the ground and diagnose the issues you've got to deal with, um, despite working to a donor framework. So how did they uh, maintain really some leadership uh, and some degree of autonomy within that network, uh, despite obviously delivering to a, a donor framework and, and a grant program? In terms of um, leadership of the network, it was initially very um, strained when we started working with them in uh, 2009. Um, so um, one of the ideas that came up that we pursued was to develop a memorandum of understanding that would create a clear framework. And this took time to negotiate and um, slowly and gradually they started working through this. But like with um, many African contexts, the people that took the lead, I guess, were the most respected and, and the most senior. And this happened to be, in many cases, the senior clerics especially from the Coast Interfaith Council of Clerics. People would defer to them. The, the human rights actors and the rest would, would uh, tend to defer to them. But we had also a rotational kind of uh, approach in the network uh, memorandum that uh, gave the chair of the network to different people. Um, on, I think it was a, every six months, there was, there was a rotation. Um, in terms of the institutional um, framework for uh, um, delivering activities jointly, the donor was very clever in terms of not only funding, having a, a funding for the individual organizations, but there was also a specific basket fund for joint activities so that they planned activities together and then drew from this fund so that nobody felt strained or felt that our budget is being exhausted from, uh, for an activity or a strategy or an approach that we don't necessarily um, fully uh, uh, support. And then you, there was one other question I think that uh, you asked yeah, about about um, autonomy. This was tricky, and this was um, this continued to dog the network up to the bitter end. The government would always tell them, "This is a European agenda. That the NIDA is funding this. Where is your autonomy on this?" And uh, mark you, this was happening. This network was rolling out its activities in a very challenging context where you want to have partnership with the government, but this is the very same government that is committing grave human rights violations in the context of its counterterrorism operations. And this is a government that is um, historically has seen civil society as mere crime spotters and informers and not really partners in security work. So it was, it was very, very tricky. Thanks for that, Mikawa. I think some really, really um, uh, helpful insights and, and I, you know, I, I think from the Strong Cities work that we've done with partners in Kenya, uh, certainly can see uh, some of the issues that you, you speak to. We only have a, a couple of minutes before we move on to the next session, but before we, we do that, Mark, it, it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, um, what's been the impact of, of COVID uh, to the network? And, and are networks more useful or networks less useful uh, in the, um, now that we are in the COVID, uh, era, I don't say post-COVID era. Um, first of all, I, I, I have to say that networks um, had to adapt to the new situation. First of all, it's it's not as easy to have prevention work um, or to 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 have prevention work when you are in a lockdown, but it's easy for people to radicalize. So 
we, we had to develop or the networks had to develop new strategies to, re to reach out to the people. Um, then to, to answer your question, it's really more important and it probably um, for Germany at least, uh, if, you're, if you're seeing some of the discussions and, uh, uh, and protests, and part of Germany against uh, COVID measures, for example, and radicalization uh, prevention is really important. And the network, the role of the networks um, is more important than ever. And it's really, uh, there, there's a real need to, to, um, to get more funding into networks and to support their work from from a uh, state level, but also from a national level. Mark, thank you. And I'd certainly echo that. I think we are really seeing a resurgence of engagement with the Strong Cities Network and, and with other partners. I know that Nordic Safe Cities absolutely are seeing just ever more the importance of, of these networks, both on a regional and global level. And I think um, you know, both of you in this conversation have really drawn out some some important lessons and it's uh, been very useful to have your perspectives and again from very different geographies. So thank you very, both very, very much for your contributions. Um, I, I think just by way of summarising this session, I think we've, we've learned very much around the importance of achieving critical mass among different partners on a really sensitive topic area where some of these partners, and we may be talking about small municipalities or civil society organisations, are not necessarily um, uh, the first to the table in the existing uh, uh, way that, that governments uh, and multilateral institutions tend to work on the issues of preventing and countering violent extremism. So working together, achieving that critical mass and uh, uh, supporting the um, agenda and, and advocating for the role of these partners collectively, certainly the sort of first takeaway I, I take from, from both of these presentations. Second um, was a point uh, made by both of you in, in different ways, really, but legitimacy, making sure that you can act legitimately and with the support of the community that you're trying to engage with. And, and that involves, Mark, as you helpfully set out, you know, three really important first steps, analysing the situation on the ground, uh, exploring the specific competencies that, that, that are there or that are not there, and making sure that you're addressing the gaps that you have. Um, and clarifying your mandate, and I think that speaks to another issue where networks have to, by their nature, work with a diversity of partners uh, with different strengths, weaknesses and focuses. Um, but they also have to be clear on a common vision. Uh, and I think that that is a really, really important challenge. And finally, I just say on the point of leadership, I think this is a really important one, especially where uh, the sort of donor environment is involved, maintaining that um, uh, autonomy, but really responding to the issues as they are on the ground, not the issues as they're perceived elsewhere. Uh, but really having the frameworks institutionally in place to, to facilitate collective leadership among, as we've talked about, very different partners, I think is a real challenge. And it's interesting to hear from both of these networks um, how you've done that. So, Mikewa, Mark, thank you so much for those contributions. Uh, we're now going to move on to our second um, uh, session of this webinar, and it's my pleasure uh, to hand over to my colleague, Charlotte Moyens, uh, Senior Manager with the Strong Cities Network. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you to our first panel for what I thought was a, an excellent way of uh, kicking off this webinar. So as Dan said, I'm Charlotte, I'm a Senior Manager with the Strong Cities Network, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to today's second session, which is about overcoming local challenges and how networks can both serve can both serve as, but also be used to find innovative solutions to overcome those challenges and to otherwise fill gaps in response by connecting services and resources within localities, but also across and between uh, locations. Um, so before I pass to our first speaker, I just want to remind the audience that you can post questions in the chat or using the Q&A function that Zoom provides, which you'll find in the bottom bar of your Zoom screen. Um, so now I will, pass on to our first speaker. We are switching up the agenda a little bit and we'll hear first from Norway, from Ingrid Lorang, who is director of the NCD Foundation and who will share with us some of her and the foundation's experience with supporting the Safe City Norway Network. Ingrid, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the invitation and uh, the introduction. The NCD Foundation became a member of Nordic Safe Cities in January, 2020, and now work with the network Safe City Norway. 
The NCD Foundation is the largest financial foundation in Norway, and our vision is to secure good lives in a safe society. I guess uh, it's, it's a vision that can be shared by many. We will support uh, relevant organizations and initiatives with approximately 27 million euro in 2022. Um, this session's topic is related to how networks can find innovative solutions. And uh, I'll quote the historic Norwegian writer, Olav Dun, who said that the difficulty lies not in thinking out a new idea, but in doing so alone. Uh, and the more commonly known businessman, Henry Ford, said that coming together is beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. So in short, uh, in Yancy Distribution, we believe that cooperation and networking not only help, but is a prerequisite to succeed with finding and implementing innovative and lasting solutions to major challenges in society. When we joined the network in 2020, the collaboration between Nordic safe cities and several Norwegian cities and municipalities had already existed for some time. Uh, however, much, uh, and, and much good no, uh, work and knowledge sharing was also progressing already. But however, there was a challenge related to securing sufficient funding to not only maintain the network, but also to, to start, initiate and run projects to test new ideas and, and solutions. So since the start of the collaboration and in excellent cooperation with the Secretariat of, of Nordic Safe Cities, we've strengthened the Norwegian network by supporting the member cities and municipalities and their partners in the civil sector, financially and professionally. Uh, we've so far allocated three and a half million euro to that. Uh, and in addition to that, we have helped establish arenas and meeting places for professionals and volunteers to share experience, increase learning and, and join forces. So an important task in the Safe City Network, uh, Norway Network, is to try out new concepts to create safety, building local resilience and social cohesion, as well as preventing violent extremism, polarization and hate speech. The Norwegian Network work closely together with different types of projects, uh, from dealing with questions on how to increase the number of youth taking part in democratic processes, uh, how debates online can be less polarized, how to reduce hate speech online, and how to build safe and welcoming arenas for all young people, but especially also youth at risk. The 10 municipalities and their collaborating nonprofit organizations are looking for results and knowledge of what works and how concepts and models can scale up as well for other municipalities. So they've all kind of signed up and promised to, to share uh, all their experience also with others and, and potentially new members of the network. So this is really all about a shared approach uh, across institutions, volunteers and professionals that recognize and appreciate the challenge of, of cause and effect when working on, on the toughest challenges. Um, in recent years, we have uh, in Norway, as I think also many other places, witnessed increased digital activity among extremist groups. And several reports suggest that extremism has become more and more digitally entrenched. Uh, the internet and social media have become a place where threats and hatred thrive. And at the same time, the digital and the physical have kind of merged in our everyday lives. And the Nordic intelligence services have all pointed out the, in their threat assessment that misinformation, extremism, and the radicalization on the internet are one of the major areas of focus that must be prioritized in prevention. This development is problematic for municipalities and local security workers, as it's still difficult to form an accurate picture of how a hatred, extremism, and racism travel online and spread in a geographical area such as a city. Even less is the knowledge of how local actors can work preventively and, and concretely against these digital patterns and expressions of hatred. So meeting these challenges requires a systematic understanding of why, where, and how the local hate speech is formed and spread to avoid acting randomly or too late when, uh, when the hatred has already taken root in the physical environment as well. So therefore, through uh, the Safe Cities Norway, we've start, uh, started a project called Safe Digital City to strengthen the digital prevention work locally. The work builds on network experience from other Nordic cities, uh, but is the first of its kind in Norway. The collaboration means that a selected group of cities will have the opportunity to map the public conversation online locally in each city and at the same time prepare a national analysis and mapping of hateful conversation on publicly available social media in Norway. So that can be used also by, by many and, and newly joining uh, members of the network. 
So all in all, I hope this gives uh, some perspective on how we in the Intedia Foundation see that collaboration and networks prove to innovate and can make a difference towards creating good lives in a safe society. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that very insightful um, intervention. Uh, lots of very important topics that you touched on, especially the, the last topic around integrating an understanding of the digital in that local approach, which we know through the Strong Cities Network has been a challenge really for local actors, how, how that we, in our programming and our policy, recognize the integration between the on and offline worlds and how that we then respond appropriately. Um, so thank you for that, it was very interesting. Um, we have a little bit of a change of agenda. So I'm now going to invite Yeppe from Nordic Safe Cities who opened up the webinar to join us for a Q&A session. Hi, Yeppe. Hi, Shalit. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I guess I'll just start by posing a couple of questions that I have. And, as, and I'm just gonna remind the audience as well, if you have any questions, obviously don't hesitate to put them in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, but I guess I'll start with how, what is the, so with a national network, um, like Safe Cities Norway's, what is the entry point into new locations? Like, how do you, how do you like build a trust with a new location and, and service providers in a new location to then make sure that, you know, they're part of the network and part of that infrastructure that you're building? Well, I, I can try to say a little bit about that now. And, and um uh, yes, but on, on some of this, uh, you know, probably as much of the details as I do, but uh, but it's, it's one thing that's really important and, and that fascinates me a bit because in the NCD Foundation, we've seen that, um, uh, well, it's not a surprise to anyone, but money talks. So the thing is that if you want someone to collaborate, and we truly believe that it's so important to bring different types of institutions uh, across government, uh, the, the social, the civil sector, uh, volunteer, uh, every all of these organizations together so that you really can mobilize across all sectors and through that strengthen and uh, and increase the, the chance of success on, on very difficult issues. And as it turns out, uh, if you put money on the table and say that, you know, if you cooperate, this is, this is how we'll help you. Then people tend to say, ah, then, you know, I want to be part of it. Uh, and and it's, it's simple, but it's important. And that's kind of also what we